Honesty is the currency for connection. It's a gift we give each other that strengthens bonds and deepens relationships. Honesty is a practice where we start from the heart. Being honest isn't always easy, and being honest all of the time is impractical. Giving honest feedback or sharing opinions requires sensitivity to the context and meeting others where they are with kindness and empathy. Honesty is about providing the information that you would want if you were in a similar situation. Another way to look at honesty, it's a flower born out of the soil of trust, connection, and conversations. The more we nurture conversations that breed trust and forge a connection, the more honesty becomes baked into the way we lead our lives. This month's global exploration of honesty was chosen by our friends in Cardiff and illustrated by James Lewis. So my friend Susan Lustenberger is an author, speaker, psychic medium, and a serial entrepreneur. I, there's this interesting thing about mediums and it's kind of like fitting to be in October because they have this spooky kind of yeah. <laughs> misnomer. But mediums can also be soccer moms and cool ladies next door and just friends. And that's what I love about Susan is she's so relatable and warm as a person, but so insightful. She literally changed my life. So I'm very, very grateful for her. And in 2010, Susan capsized the sinking ship that was her own seemingly perfect life by committing to two things, being happy and finally telling the truth. After 48 years of lying about who she was and who she was not, Susan told the truth and a fabulous life unfolded in the most amazing and magical way. Through her intuitive mentoring, Susan has helped thousands of others do the same. I'm so happy to have Susan on the stage today. Please help me welcome her. even all the new, everybody, for the new people that came out too that are going to listen to me speak and listen to what I have to say. I am a medium. And what that means is I perceive, I see, I feel, I sense a little different way than all of you. You all are mediums and intuitive and have psychic ability. But just like every, it just like we're all born being able to walk, but we're not all Olympian sprinters. So for me, the other thing it means, I'm going to put this down. The other thing it means is that when I say in this room I am a medium, I get all these flashes of awarenesses, thoughts, energies, and vibrations. And so I hear the predominant ones I hear are, oh my God, how cool! I hope that. She does something really amazing. <laughs> the next one I get is, ooh, God, breakfast was really good. Coffee, I don't have to go to work till 11 today. I hope this is okay. And the third one I get is, she's lying. That doesn't exist. So here's the thing. That is no different than all the judgments that all of you get every single day. But, you, but I can feel them. I can process them. I can organize them. They don't bother me. That's just, we all have vibrations. I see in vibrations. Oh, hold on. There you go. Um, and so about 12 years ago, I found a book called Power Versus Force by Dr. David Hawkins, and it is brilliant and it explained you guys what I could see what I was seeing I can see vibrations in the air I can see um, energies expand and contract and this was the very first book that said that we all are vibrations and we calibrate every single thing in our life calibrates whether it's broccoli or the Holocaust and what we do in every choice and every single thing that comes out of our mouth either raises or lowers our vibration. And I'm not talking about our mood or our emotions. I am talking about our life 
force energy that runs through our body and emits out into the world that we create. And I, at 40, was, I, I could not believe my eyes. Most of the world, I want you guys to really pay attention to this, most, 82% uh, vibrate at fear or below. And check it out. Hello. Yes, we do. And when we tell ourselves a lie and we're sitting up in acceptance, reason, love, and joy, we just start hammering away at our vibration. And so the other thing, me being psychic and a medium, means is that I'm highly clairvoyant. All of you got a beautiful little gift from me. So take it out, and I want you to look at this. When somebody tells me a lie, this is exactly what I see between me and them. And this is whether the person says, I didn't murder him. It looks like this. I didn't sleep with your best friend. Looks like this. You look fabulous in those jeans. <laughs> Looks like this. And oh, I didn't get your voicemail. Looks like this. And a lie is a lie is a lie. And when we tell ourselves enough of these, and these fill up our body. Because what it does when we're talking and you lie or I lie, it goes between us and it creates a barrier and a wall of this. It's so disgusting. But what it does that is so unforgivable is it deposits itself in our cellular structure and our neural pathways. And then we get depressed and we become soulless. And we can't get out of our own way. We cannot see out of this freaking stuff. And so at, in my 40s, you guys, I was filled from head to toe with this. I was filled every cell, every neural pathway, everything inside and out of me was this. And I couldn't see out of the lie. And I couldn't, I was the lie. And it was on purpose. I wasn't a compulsive liar. I was on purpose. A little drink of water. So what got me there? Three big things. One, I was born into this big, beautiful family that taught me that our family belief system was, if you are honest, you are mean. So nice people lie. It's polite. You don't tell the truth. But then two things happened that were pivotal on my path. And as a little girl, I was clairvoyant. I could see spirits. My grandfather died at four, and I never saw him go away. And I could see other people that had died. And I could see, I could see issues that were happening. And I wasn't quiet. I was a sweet little four- to six-year-old girl. But I always got told, you were dreaming, you're making it up, you just want attention, and go away. But one night, my grandmother's best friend's husband died, and we went to go pick her up and take her to the airport. And I, at six, marched right up to her, and I delivered a message from the dead guy to console her. And my sweet little 1960s housewife, quiet, passive mom, took me by the hand and took me outside. And she grabbed my face as hard as she could. And through clenched teeth, she said, you are never to speak like that again. And in that moment, I realized I was wrong. I wasn't wrong about my Uncle Spike talking to me. I was a wrong little six-year-old girl. I was a wrong person, wrong kind of person. And that shut down my clairvoyance. So I could still feel vibrations, and I could still know some things, and I was fiercely intuitive. 
But I just wasn't willing to ever be unlikable to my mom or my family or whatever that is. I was shy. I was sad. I was scared. I cried all the time. And I struggled in school because I was, I was wrong. And so I lived in fear. Flash forward to, my, to 12 years to when I was 18. And I was in my senior year in high school. And I was in geometry class with the varsity basketball team and the best looking geometry teacher an 18-year-old girl could ask for. <laughs> I, I hid my whole life. And I hid because I was never right in school, but I knew for whatever reason in that moment, I knew the answer up on the board. And as a miracle had happened, I raised my hand. And this beautiful man, beautiful smile across his face, leaned back on his desk and said, Miss Conlon, it is better to remain silent and have people think you are stupid than to open your mouth and remove all doubt. That's crazy ass shit. <laughs> and so in that moment, I swear I went deaf or blind or something because I don't remember anything, but I picked, I stood up, I picked up my books, and I left. And I never went back. And when I say that I never went back, I didn't not just go back to geometry. I went down. I was 18. I emancipated myself, and I dropped out of high school. And in that moment, I swore and committed to never removing doubt again. And I just slammed or shut. But in that moment, something amazing and beautiful and empowering happened. I saved myself. I said, I have had enough. I give up on you. I've already given up on me, but now I give up on you. And do you know that I never didn't have an opportunity, and I didn't ever um, I did not live a life what people judge high school dropouts. And that is because I went out in the world to ditch her and create her, and I was always going to be what they wanted me to be. And I succeeded beyond measures. Doors flew open for me. I started climbing the corporate ladder so fast, I never even addressed my education on a resume, and no one asked. Because when we look at each other, we either see that we're alike or we see that we're different. And people want to be alike. And so as I climbed with each rung of the corporate ladder, my self-esteem started to plummet. And I knew I could not sustain this lie. And when you lie in relationships, every single relationship is temporary every single one and you choose you either ditch the lie or you ditch the relationship and I always choose chose the relationship and so my life was great I got married didn't believe in marriage but you know I lived in a lie and I had three of the only truths that I ever had and that were my kids and I lived happily ever after temporarily, <laughs> right? And so what happened is that 2007, my dad died, and I was in the room. And when my dad died, he gave me a little kick in the butt. And all I could do was have utter clairvoyance. And I was in a hospital, and I could see spirits and energies. I could not control it. In 2007, everything that I had tried so hard to shove down was kapam in front of me. 
So I immediately came home and I signed up for classes and got a mentor and I immersed myself in everything to organize me and to organize and give processes and protocols to what I was doing. I was meditating twice a day. I was immersed in intuition and you cannot be immersed in that and not start immersing yourself in the truth. And when I started seeing the truth again of who I was, something also simultaneously started happening. I started seeing everybody's lies. And so my life became a completely unacceptable situation. And one day, I was really sick. I was bald up here from stress. I had blisters all on the right side on my optical nerves, and I was going blind. And the doctor walked into my, her office and said, what are you not looking at? And I had, the next day actually, I had the hardest conversation with my husband. And I pulled that rug out from him, from my kids, from our entire community. And not for the very first time, not so I can go and lie more, but so I could finally be honest. And so I could provide a truthful life for my children. And I picked up my children and my dog, and we moved to Northern California. And I blew up every single relationship. I crushed people left and right because they would not like who I really was. But I became me. And you guys, when we tell the truth, the time in our life expands. We have energy. We have bandwidth. We are no longer just exhausted at the end of our day. When we are exhausted, we are not being who we really, really are. And so in this search of happiness and truth, there are three things that we all, their lies every single one of us tell. Number one, I need. No. Air, water, shelter, food, and love. Anything beyond those five things, we want. But when we say we need, we immediately go down to lack. And lack lives in fear, grief, grief, and apathy. And so we don't need. We want that job. We want that car. And if you don't have confidence to say, I want that position or I want that partner, try it. What happens is the energy and the vibration of confidence takes over. Because when we say we need, we say, I'm dying, I'm barely surviving, so I just need that. What the universe does is when we deliver on need, it, 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 it wants to deliver on want. It delivers fast and furious and abundantly and prosperous on want. But when we say, I need, so I just want to survive, so just send me that, we're constantly in survival mode. Lie two, I can't. If you, someone is physically restraining you or you are geographically, you can't physically do something, you are telling a lie. When we say I can't, what we really mean is I don't want to. I don't want to because I've made another commitment. You know I don't want to answer that or have that conversation right now because I don't know all of my information. I don't want to commit to that meeting because I don't know if it's going to work out for me in what I'm doing. But we say, oh, I can't. Can't puts us immediately in victim mode. I have no control over my life. Everything is decided for me, so I can't. It's a lie. The third one is 
a lie that we are raised telling ourselves. We don't think we're lying, and it's a lazy lie. And that is, I don't know. We are born with an intuitive compass, and if we go inside and if we look at ourselves and look at the truth of who we are, we absolutely know. What you really mean, or what we really mean, is I don't want to answer that. It's not allowed. My children were raised, they are not allowed to say I don't know. And so when I say, what, is, what do you want for dinner? I get, I don't want to decide tonight. Or what are my options? Or let the girls decide, whatever that is. Because when we sit in, I don't know, that we're buying time but we're buying time for something we don't want to look at. We don't, we're, we're not going inward. And so if you say, you know, there, is, there are so many options, but I don't want to answer that, then you're not only saying, I, I don't know, but you're saying, I don't want. And so this, this enthusiasm and this spirit and this consciousness and confidence takes over us, and we reclaim ourselves, and that is what I did. And that is how I got to honest. It set, I know it's so cliche, but the truth sets us free. Do I have time to tell my story super fast? Oh, this is going to knock your socks off. Okay, so this goes back to the medium thing. We never take lies to the grave. I am so blessed and so lucky to see that all the time. And so about five years ago, I was, a gentleman was referred to me by his wife, who was a client of mine. And he, his name was David. And David was a super successful executive with a beautiful family, beautiful home, all of the perfect little life that we all try so hard. But something inside of him was empty and was missing something. And so I had an office at the time. And so David walked in the office, and I have pretty strict protocols for, like, spirit to come in, and I run this little light through you, and yada, yada, yada. And it was like, David walked in, and I was like, whoa, your dad's here. And I said, and he's, like, really here, like, his arms around you, he's saying, this is my kid. And David looked right at me and said, my dad's alive. And I looked right at him, and I said, mm, he's here. Your dad is here. Because I, let me just say this. What I know in my mediumship, clairvoyance, claircognizance, all of it, I know to be more truthful than what I see here in this world. So he sat down, and I just said, now let me describe him. And I said, he is this tall, handsome, Hispanic American man. He's so effervescent. He is telling me you are his kid and he is your dad. And David looked at me and goes, you just described every living and dead person, man in my family, and my dad is alive. And so this spirit, this gentleman, would not let it go. And I could not move on to do a 90-minute reading. It was so aggravating. And we came to, and it was so awkward, too. I have to tell you, when someone's telling you you're wrong as a medium, that is really awkward. <laughs> and so he, I said, do you have, like, was there anybody that's dead now that was, like, bossy and tried to control you? And he goes, you know, again, he said, cousins. He said, I had an uncle. And I said, okay. I said, so we agreed after 30 minutes to totally disagree. And I moved on. And I gave him what I thought was a fabulous reading. And except for that little huge glitch. And so the next day, I got a text from his wife oh, saying, we need to talk immediately. And I was so worried. And so I called her up. And she said, you were right, and he doesn't know. This man had been living a life with an empty thing because he didn't know, and intuitively, he did. And so she told me the story, and she just said um, they were teenagers. She got pregnant. He was not in a position. 
um, mental, he was not in a position because he just didn't want to be a dad to have it. And his little brother was madly in love with her. And his little brother, I get all wispy, um, his little brother stepped up and said, I will marry her and we will start a family with, on one condition. No one is ever to know he's not my son. And the mom honored that and the entire family honored that. And then my client, the woman, got pregnant with their first child and the mother actually told her the truth and told her that what had, I, I don't know even why that happened, but that happened. So my client, not David, but his wife, was faced with this situation because that night at dinner as she was doing, pardon me, doing dishes, he said, can I ask you a question? He said, you know that weird little thing that kind of came out in my family years ago about my uncle maybe being my dad? Do you think that could be true? And in that moment, she had a choice. And she didn't do anything. She texted me the next day. She was like, oh, it could be true, you know. And then they talked. They, the mom came to visit, and they talked. And they imparted the truth on this gentleman. And instead of him being enraged at all the years of lies, he felt complete. He felt truthful. He was no longer missing. In his own words, he said, I have a dad here that loves me so much, that, that loves me so much that he wanted everybody to lie. And I have a dad that no wonder when I was such a crazy, insane teen, I never got arrested or, or died like most of my friends. He was wildly protected. And it changed the trajectory of that man's life, of his kid's life, of everything. I am so grateful for this room and the energy in it because I can feel the energy and I am so glad to be here with all of you. And so I think now we're going to move to questions. Okay, who's first for a question for Susan? Heather. <laughs> that sounded so taunting. I will tell you, Rebecca, that sounded taunting. Oh. Hello. Hello. I was curious if you have any uh, tips on how to develop your intuition. If you would take 10 minutes every day and sit in the same place and just set the intention that you want to connect with your intuition and the truth of the life around you and just sit there quiet. And I know meditation is actually really hard for people. I'm not asking you to do that. I'm asking you to sit quietly with your intuition and just be. I had a mentor that told me to do the meditation so hum. And I was flighty when I started. So hum in Sanskrit means I am. And she said, don't, call, don't talk to me. We're not talking for 30 days. And the whole 30 days, I was going, some ho. <laughs> some ho. Some ho. So don't do that. Just sit in silence, and then in a piece of paper, I want you to write down what you think, feel, or sense. OK? You guys, I know it's a really heavy topic to talk about lying. So you can always get a hold of me if there's something that you want to ask me that you do not want to ask in this room. And I am absolutely all over that. OK, go ahead, Rebecca. Hello. Hi. Um, so I have been seeing these just insane numbers since 2011. And I just don't understand them. Does that, do they have meanings to them? They I mean, I absolutely it, do. And actually, there's a book by Doreen Virtue that is, um, I think it's called either Guided by Numbers or Communications from Angels. And the whole back is what number combinations mean. You can actually Google what does the number that you're seeing mean, and you will get pages of it. And, it, you know, I hear that all the time. And that is, you know, maybe something for you is to look into numerology. 
because we either, we either resonate with numbers or we resonate with vision and words. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Hi. Hi. Um, so I've been really digging in deep with the intuition. Excellent. And um, I'm learning a lot about how it connects with creativity and how you can tap into a deep like part of your mind and, and everything, your whole being, to, to use your intuition to create. Do you know, um, is there anything you can say about that at all? When and how we it connects with creativity. Yeah, no, when we are creative, we are vibrating really, really high because we're in joy and love. And so we, and let me just be really clear, spirits and our intuition that's around us that we generally cannot see vibrates at lightning speed. We do not vibrate at that type of speed. When you are being creative and tapping into your pineal and your pituitary glands, you are vibrating much, much higher. And that the reason why you get intuitive hits that way or when you're in joy, it's because you match. Does that make sense to you? So it's wildly important. I actually have a client that cannot um, do development unless she's coloring and coloring books and then downloads come in. So it's what, so one of the things you might want to do also is just set an intention for channel writing because it sounds like you could do that and just post a question up on top of a page and write but be really, really relaxed and see what comes through for you. Great. Thank you. You're welcome. Um, I have a quick question. How do you differentiate overthinking and intuition. <laughs> I love you! Because overthinking makes you feel like shit and intuition does not. There you go. Right? And actually, more seriously, when you are sitting in silence, so I always tell people in development, when you get an intuitive hit, there is no emotional charge. So I've sat in a room, in, room with a woman that I knew was going to commit suicide. And there was, when I got that download, there was no emotional charge. Now the me, after that reading, when I got back to me, freaked out and started trying to fix things, right? But there's, there's, it's, it's just, it's a, it's a silence within you that feels really, really truthful. Hi, I was wondering... It's, it's probably related to two or three other questions that were already asked, but how do you actively raise yourself along that color scale that you showed? Is there, is there yeah, what should you do? Yeah. <laughs> you know what? You, every single choice you make raises it. So if you, um, if I have time, I'll teach the room that just you asking the question, you getting to a vibration where you don't feel shame, guilt, don't do things that cause you shame. Don't do things that cause you guilt. If you have people in your life that make you feel wrong, shameful, or guilty, when you tell the truth, I want you to show them the door and kick them as hard as you can out of it. And that's what it is. And so it might be really good for you to get that book, just because, like, to use it as a reference. It's a really um, dry read, but it is... It's like my Bible. It's amazing. And it tells you how. What's it called again? Power versus force. I'll, act, I'll figure out a way for Rebecca to put it all up and everybody to get it to you guys, all the resources. Does that help you? Okay. Hi, Susan. <laughs> <laughs> so I... <laughs> So quick plug. I didn't know you were. <laughs> Hi. Hi. So um, quick plug. I have utilized Susan's services, and I'm <laughs> going to start crying because, like, I just I can't thank you enough. She's really, really good, and she's really helped me clarify a lot of things. And so thank you. Um, but one question I have, because something you said about what your mom did to you really resonated. And I'm sure some of us have experienced that. You know, maybe our parents wanted us to be doctors or accountants instead of creatives or artists or, you know, intuitive. So whether it's children, whether it's our nieces and nephews, any of the littles in our life, how do we help them connect to that and not lose that and get it beaten out of them? Your, the, your um, intuition, is that yeah, what you're talking about? Yeah, how do we help um, the little people in our lives So when they talk that? and when they have um, make-believe friends or when they start talking kind of crazy, you just, you listen, you hold space, you ask them some other questions, you tell them it's really good for little kids to draw their, what they're getting intuitively. 
Um, you don't, one of the things that we do that is so horrible to kids is when we, our child comes up to us and says, and senses that something's really, really wrong and says, are you mad? Are you upset? We always do this happy little face and know everything's fine. And you just in that moment taught your child to never trust their intuition. So when you say it, when they do that and you say, you know, I am not feeling myself today. You are super perceptive. Thank you so much. You just told them that they are right and that they are not a wrong child. Did you say you wanted to do something? We have a couple minutes. About vibrations? You said you had a... Oh, yes. Okay. <laughs> Sorry. My energy goes blah. Um, it's also way too much coffee. <laughs> okay. I want everybody to put your feet flat on the floor. I'm going to teach you guys what your body does to an intuitive yes and what your body does with an intuitive no, okay? So I want everybody feet flat on the floor, sitting straight up, and I want you to close your eyes and take three deep breaths in and three exhales. And as you do that, I want you to start at the very top of your head and just take an inventory of your physical body. So, all the, so scan down it. Scan down your head, your face, your neck, your shoulders, all the way down to the soles of your feet. I am going to say a word four times, and I want you to pay attention to what happens inside of your body when I say this word. Yes. Yes, yes, yes. Can I have about two or three people raise your hands and tell me where that hit you? Yes? It came up, okay. Anybody else want to tell? Yes? Okay, yes? You? Okay. All right, so I want you to close your eyes and take another deep breath, and I want you to do another inventory and set the intention that you are going to clear out all the vibrations that we just put in your body of awareness. Okay, I'm going to say a word four times, and I want you to pay attention to what happens in your body. No. No, no, no. And when you are ready and have paid attention, you may open your eyes and I'll have two or three people raise your hands and tell me how that hit you. Yes, in the back. Yes. What color? I saw red on yes, no. Okay, so you're really clear. That means you're really, really in your third eye. And so that's good. Yes. Okay, yes? It shifted down. That's primarily, go ahead. They were on no or on yes? Okay. This is what your body does. A no is a lie and a yes is truth. And so I parent that way. I run all my businesses that way. Everything I do is how I feel in my body because we, we are an instrument and we are attuned. And when we're truthful, our, our instrument is magnificent. And so you guys just do that. Do that with what do I want to eat? We all calibrate. Remember, we all calibrate. We're all vibrations. And so that is how you can sit and establish and develop your own intuitive compass. I hope that this helped everybody or one person. And I hope you guys have a great day. Thank you. Thank <laughs> you.